Okay, hello sixth graders. Here we go. This is lesson 10. And let me get the page just a little larger here. Okay, we'll click that out of the way. All right, so first thing is that I want to refresh you on what we did in the previous lesson, nine. So we did the read aloud of the fight, um, and we saw that Will kind of got himself into some trouble. And the task at hand in this whole bend is to really pay attention to the setting and how the setting and the character's actions create this mood. And then the mood can really create further um, issues with the characters. It's almost like a snowball effect. You know, one thing causes another to happen, which can cause another and another. And so we just see that take place in the fight. And remember, I only used the first page. And so I said it was okay with me if you it would go ahead and use um, later on in the fight. You could use that story. You could have used popularity um, to do some of this work. Or you could use the book that you're actually reading, all right, to practice the skill of looking for the setting, which is the where and when it's happening, what action is taking a place or what words are being spoken and from that what is the actual mood and the mood is the feeling that the reader feels okay and in this case the that's the same mood as what that setting you know is going on with that setting all right so now that we've talked about what we did previously and you're kind of in the right spot um, mentally Let's talk about the lesson today. And the lesson today is that I'm going to teach you that particular language, both literal and figurative, affects the mood, atmosphere, and in turn, the characters. All right, so I had this picture of some notes from my board um, at school. And literal just means what it says is what it means. So, you know, if I said the guy's mad, he's just mad. If I said he's driving a red car and I have no alternative purpose in that, it's just a red car, it's literal. Figurative is when something means more than what it really says. And I think some of you are used to figurative language like metaphors, and similes and personification and hyperbole and just to review what some of those are you know a simile is a comparison with like or as so she dances like a, a butterfly right she is being compared to a butterfly and I have the word like in there if I said she is a butterfly it becomes a metaphor no like or as still she is compared to a butterfly if I say she has danced a million times in the recitals. That's hyperbole. It's exaggeration, hyper exaggerated. If I said, um, I can't think of one for her for personification, but what if I said the, the leaf danced across the lawn? All right, I just mean the leaf is being blown across the lawn. All right, and so I'm using personification, acting like it's human or a person. <clears throat> so, that's kind of some figurative language you're familiar with. So let's break this down into two categories. Something that is symbolic, and this might be new for you, is when one thing stands for another, right? One thing stands for another. And I have this little wonderful cheat sheet. I love this cheat sheet. And this is really a purposeful lesson because you're going to run into a lot of figurative language and especially symbolism, um, which is a type of figurative language, All right? And these, this paper doesn't list them all, but it's very uh, thorough. So if I said that he's driving a red car and I don't just, you know, there's more to it than he just likes red. All right. Something a little deeper. Maybe this guy had just stolen money from a bank and he's driving away in a red car. All right, well, red can stand for excitement, energy, passion, power, heat, love, blood, aggression, danger, 
fire, war, all things intense and passionate. I, if I'm writing a story, I might very well want to put this person in a red car to express the fact that it's dangerous and intense. So I choose that color on purpose to symbolically represent that danger and intensity. Where if I said he was driving away in, say, a, I don't know, black car. All right, let's pick black. Black can be power, formality, elegance, wealth, fear, evil, anonymity, unhappiness, evil, sadness, remorse, anger, mourning, and death. And the police are on his heels and they pull him over. All right. I might be using black there to kind of show this whole thing of remorse, sadness, like it's coming to an end, you know, something like that. So all I'm saying is sometimes there are purposes in the author choosing um, colors to represent something and make you think about that even subconsciously. All right. Objects. All right. So, um, if I wanted to express that a setting was extremely cozy, you know, let's say these ranchers are out in the wild and their horses are tired. And so they decide to bed down and build a fire and they're talking around the fire late at night. All of a sudden it goes to this from this desolate, scary feeling to, oh, there's warmth, All right? Because fire is warmth, comfort, passion, All right? It can be destruction. But in this case, the author would mean it like, it's going to be okay. You know, like it's, there's warmth and coziness, all right, and comfort. So these colors can represent certain things. Uh, and I'm going to run through these. And I'm not going to read all the words. I'll just say basics. All right, I already read red. Yellow can be joy and happiness. Blue, peace, tranquility. Orange, energy, warmth, alert. Green, nature and environment. Jealousy, too. Purple, royalty, right? Nobility, being mysterious. Gray can be modesty, um, boring. Brown, earth, home, outdoors. White is purity, innocence. Black, I already mentioned, right? If we go over to the objects, I already talked about fire. The sun can be brightness or happiness, a new day. A tree, wisdom, old age or nature. The cross is religion or spirituality. We have a gem or a diamond, strength, everlasting love. All right, we have the skull, death, evil, or poison. We have the hourglass, mortality, um, eternal passage of time, the light bulb, ideas, thinking, energy, and the owl, wisdom, and uh, helpfulness, maybe even prophecy. Okay, so this will be where you can find it in the reference. All right, but as you're reading, um, I want you to think about those kind of things. All right, so that's one of the things I'm going to teach you, and I kind of already did, but we're going to look at it in practical purposes in a minute. And the other thing I want to talk to you about is how to insert evidence, because when you find this symbolism, you have to be able to insert it. All right, so let's go back to this a minute and see where we're at. All right, the other type of figurative language is connotative a deeper meaning than just the definition. So let me give you a couple examples here. All right, I need to get my pen handy. So let's say that you have, um, oh, connotative meaning. All right, let's say that there are different meanings for a word, first of all, okay? So, Let's say the word is slender and skinny. One of these words has a more positive connotation than the other. I'm trying to focus that a little bit better for all of you. Hold up here a second. There we go. All right. So they both mean, if I were to look up a dictionary definition, all right, the denotation, the dictionary definition might be to be at uh, just below normal weight. All right, 
just below normal weight. All right, that's the denotation. But if I ask you the connotation, one of these words is more positive than the other. All right, to be slender just sounds like it's going to be nicer looking than skinny. Skinny almost seems like a little too thin or something. All right, so this word slender seems to have a more positive connotation than skinny. Skinny is not bad, but it's just not as nice sounding. All right, let me give you another set of words. What about antique and old? All right. Well, if I ask you um, the dictionary definition, the denotation, it would be something made in the past. But if I get to the connotation, there's a more positive word here and a more negative. Obviously, furniture that is antique sounds nicer looking than furniture that is just old. Okay? All right, so that's what that means, but that's figurative, all right? We just get a flavor for that, so to speak. All right, so let's rehearse here what we've learned so far. We've learned that there are literal things, things that what it says is what it means, and that's mostly what we find when we read. But sometimes we come across figurative language when it means more than just what it says. And there are two types. It can be symbolic, one thing stands for another, or it can be connotative, a deeper meaning than the definition. All right, so we're going to apply that, and then we're going to write about it, okay? And when we write about it, we're going to pay attention to how to insert the evidence, all right? Inserting evidence, the text says, but there's lots of other choices. We could use early in the book, readers learn, blah, 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 and that blah, blah, blah goes in quotes because it's right word for word from the text. Or we could say the author paints the picture saying blah, 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 or the text says, or Will notices as the story says, and in quotes the evidence, all right? to go from citing the text to actually saying what you think. You have to explain how that evidence shows what it is you're trying to prove. You can't just insert evidence and not say why you in, you're telling us this evidence. You have to explain it. You can't assume that everyone understands what your point is. This shows that, or this illustrates that, or this demonstrates that. Readers realize that. This changes everything, whereas before I thought this, now this. Readers begin to wonder, question, or worry, or understand, or the important thing to notice about this is that it means whatever. Okay, so now we're going to look at this in practicality. All right, so actually from the story, and I don't think I grabbed the story. Give me one second. And I actually decided to use the story from Bend One for this. That way, if you want to use the fight, you can. I'm not giving anything away. Um, so Mrs. Elwood, I know, read this in Bend One, Popularity. This is where Will is really wanting to be popular. And it says, while the two Allens faced off, I looked across the black tar and asphalt at a crowd of boys who were making more noise and seemed to be having more fun than anyone else on the playground. These were the popular boys, and in the center of this group stood their leader, Sean Owens. All right, I want to say that there is symbolism here with the black tar and the asphalt. All right, there's figurative language there. There's more to it in this setting this author has created this in the setting so that it just appeals to what's happening with this character and it helps create a mood. 
okay? And I'm going to help you remember what black is again. So black, power, formality, elegance, wealth, fear, evil, anonymity, unhappiness, evil, sadness, remorse, anger, mourning, and death. Well, I could see how power for the popular people plays a role. Um, fear for Will, will he ever be popular? Anonymity, it's like they don't know who he is. He's a nobody to them. He is unhappy. There's sadness. Uh, maybe a little remorse. And almost like mourning the death of him not being popular. All right. So definitely that black was placed there to emphasize it's not just a road. All right. The author could have just said a road. He says a black, uh, or I'm sorry, black tar and asphalt. All right. And we know that tar is sticky. So I've done my two jobs. I have found my evidence. And now I have written about it the right way. So my way to intro my evidence early in the story, popularity, it says, while the two Allens faced off, I looked across the black tar and asphalt. All right, and I don't have to put the whole sentence. I, I put the ellipsis there at the end because I've said what I need to say. All right, so I have my tag to insert my evidence, and then I explain how this evidence proves my point. The important thing to notice about this is that it's more than a road separating Will from the unpopular people and the popular people. The tar is sticky and the asphalt is black. He is in a difficult, sticky situation if he wants to be popular. It seems almost impossible to accomplish or far away. Okay, so this is going to be your job. You are going to either use the book you're reading or you could go back and use the fight. And I want you to find some evidence that is figurative in nature, whether it is symbolic or connotative. I'm guessing a lot of you are gonna find symbolic. It's kind of fun to try out the symbolic. Um, language and then I want you to write about it all right and remember to use your insertion tags all right that handout will be there in the lesson folder so you can get to it some way and you can see that I even turned mine into a nice paragraph Early in the story popularity, it says, while the two Allens faced off, I looked across the tar and asphalt. The important thing to notice about this is that it's more than a road separating Will from the unpopular people and the popular people. The tar is sticky and the asphalt is black. He is in a difficult situation if he wants to be popular. It seems almost impossible to accomplish or far away. All right. So I hope that you know what your task is. You're going to lift a line of evidence that shows figurative language, and then you're going to write about it. Tell us what it is and tell us how it proves your point. Signing off. See you later.